what's up beautiful people it's your boy Gideo and i'm back again with a new video today we're going to be checking out line to children with helen joyce and this video or this interview is conducted by jordan b peterson once again it's gonna be my first time checking this one out i'm excited i'm ready for it without wasting your time let's get to it it can turn into healthy whole responsible good adults who can live full rounded satisfying lives that are not just good for themselves but good for the other people around them you know that's again i have to turn to the sacred language like this is a sacred task and to see people so willfully tell small children lies like that you can be either sex if you want or that sex is a spectrum <laughs> or that we were assigned a sex at birth so she said sex is a spectrum is a lie or that some people are non-binary or that if you you know if when you're seven you decide that you're really a boy you'll just go on puberty blockers and take testosterone and there'll be a little operation and i i feel livid at these people really livid yeah i i feel exactly the same well hence my banning from is that hate speech <laughs> is what she's saying hate speech or will it be the truth or the facts let me know what let me look let me know your thoughts on that one I, I feel livid at these people, really livid. Yeah, I, I feel exactly the same. Well, hence my banning from Twitter, let's say. And I've taken a lot of flack about that, you know, when people tell me, well, you were so mean to Ellen Page. And I think, well, you know, Ellen Page is a star and she advertised her transformation and made the claim that this has revolutionized her life. And then she displayed her new body in a public forum and got 1.7 million Instagram likes for it and probably enticed, well, let's say one young girl who's confused into becoming sterile, which is one too many for me, but it could be as many as what, 100, 500, 1,000? And I have my tendency to feel a hell of a lot more sorry for a set of confused, isolated, and lonely, pubescent girls who have no one to love them enough to help them appreciate who they are than I do for one overprivileged and unfortunately confused narcissistic Hollywood star. Yeah, I feel the same. I mean, I don't particularly want to say anything. Even while getting emotion, you still let it out very blunt. Thing about Ellen Page, I think you've said, you said it, you said it clearly. No, no, I wasn't going to say it. I was going to say you've said it clearly enough. I would just depersonalize it. And I would say that it's back to the narcissism, the focus on one person at the expense of everybody else. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that's most remarkable about this movement is, you know, there are many people who are suffering or underprivileged or vulnerable or indeed mm -hmm. like really, really, really hard done by. Like a colleague of mine once said to me, why are we not talking about the Yazidis? Why are we not talking about child abuse victims? Why is the suffering trans person or the, the, the untransitioned trans child the martyr figure of all? And almost a yeah, well, that's what we're trying figure. to figure out, eh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and why, if you know, why is it as if to, to to sort out that child's like the worst thing that's ever happened to anybody to feel gender dysphoria? I think most people feel gender dysphoria in some respect. Um, why to sort mm -hmm. that out? Will we sacrifice any number of other people? Well, it's a angry? form of uh, it, it's a form of narcissistic self consciousness. I mean, and everyone does feel that for sure. And I think they feel that most acutely at, at puberty. I mean, people are, well, we know we're mortal. We know our flaws. We know we're going to die. We know we aren't canonical examples of our sex, that we could be much better in a thousand ways than we are. We all have to bear that burden. And so that dysphoria, that's mortality dysphoria, and it can manifest itself in all sorts of ways. And that's part and parcel of the human condition, but to entice young people into assuming that radical surgical transformation is the sure cure for that is, well, I also believe that it- Radical surgical transformation. So Ellen's page transformation was radical surgical. <laughs> In his words, I'm just saying. On the demonic, I compared the people who were doing psych, uh, doing a transformation surgery on, on minors to People who sacrifice children to Moloch, and I do. They did transformation surgeries on minors. Is that allowed? Shouldn't that be illegal? Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know if that particularly. I mean, if you're an adult and you're up to the age where you can say this is what I want to do, that's completely on you. But as a minor, 
Yeah. You see it in exactly the same way. And the weird thing about having done that, you know, this is so strange too, is that almost all the comments I got for that article from The Telegraph and also on my YouTube channel, almost all of them were supportive. Yeah. Way more than I thought there would be. And I thought, well, if everyone agrees that this is wrong, why the hell are we doing it? Postmodernism is tearing our so world apart. Agree. The one thing that may be able to unite us is a mass return to our Judeo-Christian roots. At the individual level, that means developing our prayer life. There's a ton of litcom slash truths with Hallow today. I mean, false consciousness. Yeah. People believe that other people don't agree with them. I mean, that is one of the purpose of conversations like this, is to show people that you can actually say these things. And I mean, it hasn't been easy for either you or me, and we have had well, significant blowback let's for talk, it. Let's talk about that. I want to know, like, I know what happened to me. Yeah. When you wrote this book, what happened to you? I mean, not as much as might have, because my employer isn't a coward. So uh, right. it turns out that you don't need very much bravery to stand up to these people because um, the viciousness gets worse if you give in in any way. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah you've seen that. You've seen that if somebody oh, you know, says something and then they apologize, they just come after you with redoubled ferocity. So I don't think that the editor of The Economist agreed with me, at least at first. But she doesn't like bullies uh -huh. and she does like free speech. And so the first people uh -huh. who tried to get me fired, she told them sharpish where to <laughs> put it. Uh -huh. Okay, so you had employer support. Yes, employer support is very important. I, I often think about what happens to people in this social media age, and in particular those of us who talk on trans issues, but also those who talk on race issues, as being the modern form of the pillory. So you're, you're shamed, yeah, yeah. You're shamed yeah, rather yeah. than um, injured. You're not, you're not hanged or crucified, you're, you're specifically shamed. That's the aim. Mm -hmm. And it's done in a way so as to um, maximize the fear that other people feel that they will also suffer the same fate. Because there's nothing they can do to help you if you're brought to the pillory. Like if, if a woman is brought to the pillory, let's just say a woman, because I'm a woman, another woman could go and stand by her to show solidarity, but it wouldn't do her any good. She too would be shamed then. It would just mean that there were two outcasts yeah. instead of one. So then you think like, yeah. what do you do to end the pillory? It's not mass solidarity actually, it's, um, it's powerful people. You, if you are under the protection of somebody with social capital, you wouldn't, you wouldn't suffer this fate. This was for the outcasts. So it's actually the job of employers and institutions to stand up here. You mean rather than to censor, for example? Yes, but, right, but, right. and you don't have to say very much. Like Kathleen... <laughs> he has something to say. He's trying to get a point out. Stockson at university did eventually say some good things about free speech, but she had been going for three years and they had said nothing. Mm -hmm. If the first wow. time they attacked her, the university had said very clearly, we support free speech, we support academic freedom, we do not tolerate attacks on our staff, I guarantee you the mob would have gone elsewhere straight away. Instead, it was made clear that she was available to be brought to the pillory. So I didn't have that. Okay, so then next question is, why do you think, what has changed that has made our institutions so utterly cowardly in the face of the narcissistic minority mob? Because it feels like there's a greater force controlling all the institutions now. Do you guys know? It's like there's a greater spirit or just there's a guy seated somewhere just trying to push one narrative and everybody's supportive of that one narrative. So if you come with something opposing, you're, you're the enemy, you know? Because something's changed. It wasn't like this 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You could see it a bit. It certainly wasn't like this 20 People years ago. People call it civilization, so but I don't is believe it, so. Is it... Do you think it is it fundamentally the power that social media has b brought to the to the obsessively and narcissistically outraged minority? The people make the social media, so I don't blame it on social media or technology. It's the people. Or what do you think it is? Yeah, so I think that plays a part. But the thing is, your employer can do the same thing about social media. They can just put out a short statement saying we stand by Helen Joyce or Kathleen Stocker, whoever it is she's an excellent journalist, journalist or she's an excellent academic, move on, and they move on. They really do move on. So it's the, it's the fact that institutions haven't learned to deal with social media. They think they have to engage. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they do that. It's stupid. I've seen it repeatedly. You feel like they okay, so I have a hypothesis about that. Okay. You tell me what you think of this. Well, look, if you're a conservative type, you tend to be conscientious. 
Yeah. And conscientious people tend to be guilt prone because they, they want to be seen to do their duty and they want to do their duty. And so what that means is that if you're, if you're a narcissist and a mob of 30 torch bearing neighbors show up on your doorstep and tell you that you're shameful, you don't care because you're a narcissist, you're low in conscientiousness, you're parasitic, you're disagreeable, you could care less what other people think and so the mob has no effect on you. But if you're conscientious and 30 people show up, then you're going to think, well, 30 people wouldn't be on my doorstep if I hadn't maybe done something wrong and I'm not perfect and so maybe I should scour my conscience and, you know, repent of my sins publicly because, well, why would I presume I'm right when I know I'm imperfect? That works really well on conscientious people. And now with, with the social media networks, a mob from anywhere in the world can aggregate itself. And even if it's one person in a million who's annoyed at you, if a hundred million people are watching, then a hundred people can show up on your doorstep with torches and pitchforks. And so I think that this guilt targeting that the narcissistic psychopaths use in social media is particularly effective on decent, conservative, traditional people. And so they need to learn that we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> Things are not the way they were. Yeah. You know, yep. if you're prepared yep. for it, if you know it's coming. So I think The Economist, because it's very America focused, but it's still a very British publication, I think it had a couple of years notice that things were different. And so when these started, you know, they, they were they were prepared because it's how you, it's, it's the first thing you do that's catastrophic. If you make a misstep on the mm -hmm. very first thing, then it's very hard to regain it because they know that you'll give way. You've proved it. Mm -hmm. So they will never leave you alone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was a very, very, very interesting topic. Let me know what you guys think on that video. Interesting and very sensitive points were raised in that one. And the lady even shook the table, you know, like she really shook the table. She said, kids are being lied to when you tell them that um, gender is non-binary and binary and gender is a spectrum, that that's a lie. Even um, Jordan Peterson emphasized again on the, I think, Ellen Page, said that's a radical, surgical, the words that were used were really big, but very, very... Um, intense. <laughs> Let me know what you guys think on on, on that video. I believe um, yeah, there's there's always room to to understand. You don't have to condone, but there's always room to understand. And you know, at least listen and bring up your own discussion. If you disagree with everything they said, you can't just say it is stupid. You can say it is stupid because of this. It is idiotic because of this. You know. So feel free to share your own points. And if you agree with what they say, also let me know why with points. Because <laughs> I'm excited for it. I want to see the discussions. I want us to talk about it. Anyways, that's the end of this video. Don't forget to smash that like button. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.